Welcome back to another Q&A video. Post your questions down below and let's get started. How would you minimize the health damage caused by cheap meals? Very simple, my man. You will want to have high antioxidant foods alongside the cheap meal. So if you're going to be having a pizza or a few slices of it, have a smoothie which contains greens and berries. And if you have some nice powders like amla or chifala, use that as well. Some additional advice would be to incorporate fasting. If you know you're having a big meal, fast beforehand or fast after the meal. And then finally, I would recommend that you do cardiovascular work. This way you can eliminate those sensations of bloating, plus you'll feel a lot better after it. So, and you'll burn off the calories too. So do that, all right? What is the most minimalist yoke routine that is effective? Well, you know me, I'm not really a fan of minimalist training, but if I want to be as objective as possible, what is the best way of doing it? Rack pulls above the knee and neck curls. If that's all you can do for your yoke for whatever screwed up reason, that's what I would do for the rack pulls. One set of 100 transcendent training style. That's like really, really minimalist where you're just doing one balls to the wall set. And then for the neck curls, you could do four sets of 25 to failure. And then you progressively overload on that. That's probably the most minimalist routine that I could possibly imagine, but it's what I'd recommend, okay? If my weight is staying the same, but I'm progressing on my lifts, should I be concerned? You should be concerned that maybe you have good genetics. No, but in all honesty, that's awesome, dude. Why would you be negatively concerned about this? And if anything, you should be happy that you're able to make all these strength gains while maintaining your body weight. That is amazing. Now, I don't know what your training experience is. You might be a novice. You might be an early intermediate. No matter what it is, milk those gains. That's really, really good. So, no, you should be happy, not worried, okay? If you start lifting at 12 years old, is it possible that you are gained almost your natural muscle potential at 18 years old? Absolutely not, because when you were 12 years old, your hormones were not in check. You were still a kid. Like, dude, no. Like, that's not enough time. On top of that, 18 is not where you peak anyway. Your hormones will still optimize a little bit more, and there's still other body changes that will occur, like the lengthening of your clavicles, and even your bone structure can change during that time frame. Some guys even grow past the age of 18 in terms of height and stuff like that. So, no, you have not reached your potential. In fact, I would say, even if you did nothing, you will continue to improve because of these body changes related to your age. In fact, there are some people who their linear progression gains stop when they're a young age, so they gotta switch an intermediate program. But the moment their age increases, they can actually go back to a novice program and get those linear gains. Just because of the hormonal profile and all that. Reach your so-called limit, it's gonna take more than five, 10 years, okay? It's a long process, my friend, not 18. What is the right mindset when getting back into the gym after an injury? Loss of power and strength can be very discouraging. Thanks, brother. Well, I'll probably make a follow-up video to this, but to answer your question right now, realize that Injuries happen, and it's not the end-all be-all. Move forward with this and correct whatever problems you might have. See a medical professional, consult a specialist, and get these injuries in check. Once your body is functioning normally again, muscle memory will take care of you in a major way. And then once that muscle memory is taken care of, you can just keep making those gains as usual. There are a lot of guys who have had injuries. This is very common among strength athletes, but then you hear of the comeback. Now, ideally, there should be no comeback. You should not be getting injured, but if it happens, it happens. What can you do about it? Yeah, there was a setback. It is what it is, but you know what? You're gonna overcome it. Be positive about it. Realize that you could make those awesome gains once you're nice and healed up, and it's going to be worth it, okay? So have a positive mindset instead of a negative mindset. Don't say, okay, I'm, I'm over. My athletic career is over. No, don't think of it like that. Look at the greater side of things and reap those rewards, all right? So far, I'm getting interrupted a lot by airplanes, and I don't like this buzzing sound. So although I like the idea of filming outside, it's just not really practical for all this noise. Like it's actually getting me a bit stressed out right now, but let's continue. What's your opinion on sleep apnea and neck thickness? I've seen a lot of bodybuilders and powerlifters complaining of sleep apnea, and it's clearly due to their necks. I've started neck training, but worry about sleep apnea in the future. Well, I actually just had a subscriber tell me, Alex, I'm fuming at you because I did your neck training for some months. Obviously my neck got huge, but now I'm suffering from sleep apnea. So you know what? Do neck training at your own risk if you're worried about that. I always thought that it had to do with the fat accumulation around your neck. Also, if you're a mouth breather or not, that can have an impact. Personally, when my neck was a little bit over 19 inches, I didn't have any sleep apnea. I had no problems. Uh, Mike Machine Bruce, who I interviewed, had no problems. There's lots of wrestlers who have no problems. Uh, the bodybuilders and powerlifters who complain about it the most are usually the ones that are roided out of their minds or they have very high body fat percentage. Now, that said, could it be that just having a thicker neck 
places pressure on the throat, which causes you to have breathing problems, very possible, very possible indeed. So if you're noticing that you do get sleep apnea as your neck gets bigger, well then tone it down, all right? Don't let it progress to that point and also lower your body fat percentage. So in the past, I used to say it's due to the fat, but if the muscle is the cause behind this, then you know what? Do it at your own risk, but I'm not responsible for you developing sleep apnea as a result. If you want a bigger neck, you are taking a risk in that sense, all right? Thoughts on maltodextrin and using it to add an extra 200, 300 calories a day. I don't like that idea, man, because there's no real nutrition in that. If you want extra carbohydrates or just sugars in general, just have fruit. That's bang for your buck. Add fruit to your smoothies, berries. That's what I'm all for, man. Clean stuff. Maltodextrin, what are you getting out of it? It's just like empty if you ask me. No real nutrition in that, so fuck it. Eat clean. Put berries in your smoothies, done deal. Hey Alex, what's the secret behind the floor press? For me, it just looks like a half bench press. For you, it might be half bench press. For me, it's full range of motion, touching the chest, and more difficult. I can pause bench more than I can floor press. I, I could dead bench more than I can floor press. For me, the floor press is the most difficult benching variation next to the incline press, all right? It just feels screwed up for my leverages. So for you, you might have good leverages for it. Congratulations. But you know what? Even if we account for that half range of motion, guess what? The floor press breaks up the eccentric concentric chain, which is always good for developing explosive power. And also, I've heard Louis Simmons say that the floor press is the universal sticking point. So that might benefit you in that way. If you have any weaknesses, floor press will usually help you out. So it's a tough lift, but it works great in building your raw bench. Uh, it's quite safe as well, especially with the floor being wide, right? You're not on one of those little benches there. So it's great for your shoulder health and you can't go wrong with it. Floor presses are great. Should I stay at a 20 pound bar or buy a 45 pound bar? Uh, definitely a 45 pound bar. Those 20 pounders, man, are really cheap and they might break on you. I've seen that happen in gym fail compilations depending on how heavy you go. And it's like the only real benefit I see of it is using it for like curls and extensions. But even at that, like, if you're getting very strong, you'll be advancing to a 45 pound bar, just the way it is. So just get a good bar from the get-go. You can use it for other purposes as well. You won't have to have that tiny little bar. Uh, the only small bars that I like are the easy curl ones, to be honest with you. But other than that, man, like regular Olympic bar, long sleeves, it's just the way to go. And if you have any uh, space restrictions, then I suppose you could use a 20 pounder. If you're not that strong, I suppose you could use it. But really like an Olympic is what you want, okay? Always get lower back soreness from five by five deadlifts. Any way to fix that? Well, first of all, five by five deadlifts is a lot of volume. Uh, maybe you want to cut it back to the three sets of five or even one set of five. Like if you look at most novice programs, they tend to do one set of five deadlifts because it is very, very draining on the body. Like it's not even the same as five by five squats. Like five by five deadlifts are going to kill your recovery hardcore. So personally, I'm not a fan of it at all. Like I just don't like five by five deadlifts. I'd rather you do five by five block pulls because those are safer on the lower back. Those will allow you to get the adequate amount of volume without negatively impacting your recovery. So give those a shot, and then for your pulls off the floor, you can do stuff like five sets of one. You know what I'm saying? Five sets of one at 85, 90%, done deal. You're still gonna get some good workload in there without uh, straining your lower back. So I mean, you do what you want. I'm sure there's a lot of powerlifters who do five by five pulls, man. I think for the drug-free recreational lifter, you'll be just fine with a block pull. Then for your pulls off the floor, you just do singles with higher sets. like. That's how you fix the problem completely. I'm training at home and I have a pull-up bar where I can not really go heavy on, like 80 to 90 pounds weighted max. What do you recommend for me if I want to grow stronger after this point? Well, that's enough weight. 80 to 90 pounds, you can do a lot with that. Volume. Have you tried doing five sets of 10 with 80 to 90 pounds? Like that's hardcore stuff. Like really, that's all the weight that you need for bodybuilding purposes, you'll, you'll be okay, trust me. Like I go above 135, you saw me do 160, but that's like ego in a sense and I'm just doing it because I like the heavy weights, but for bodybuilding, like it's not required, just straight up. 90 pounds is great, just do higher reps. Like even doing a simple 10 by 10 with your body weight is insanely difficult given the low rest intervals. So that's what you should do. Lower rest intervals, things like rest pause, higher repetitions, like trust me, a five by 10, something like that will serve you very, very well. So 90 pounds, you're good, trust me. You can even do things like pause reps and all that. So bro, you're good, you're good, trust me, okay? Hey Alex, if I do one hour of Taekwondo two times a week while on your novice program, will this affect my recovery? Also, will neck training be beneficial for Taekwondo? Uh, for your second answer, absolutely, man. All combat athletes should be training the neck, in my opinion. Now, in regards to impeding recovery, it should be okay. Twice a week is really good if you're gonna be doing any activities outside the gym. So, 
I think you'll be fine, to be honest with you. I really do. Get your nutrition in check. There shouldn't be any problems, okay? Uh, now, if you do have recovery problems, then lower the volume a little bit. Three sets as opposed to five sets, and I guarantee you, you won't have any problems. With program hopping being a mistake, is it possible to run something like upper rest, lower rest, rest, full body intensity, or is it just never optimal to mix programs? Well, look, when I say that you shouldn't program hop, I'm talking about lacking consistency here. Running one system that does happen to mix, like it's upper, lower, rest, and you do a full body, that's a different story. Now, whether you consider that program to be optimal or not, I'll let you decide. I'm not here to push my beliefs on you. But all I can say is that if you do run that system for a long period of time and you're consistent with it, then you'll definitely get some gains from it. So when I say that you shouldn't program hop, I mean like it's when you go from a full body to an upper lower, then an upper lower to a split, linear periodization to concurrent, then you like you're always mixing it up, but it's not the same program, you understand? So as long as you're consistent, it should be okay. Hey Alex, I injured my thumb so I can't do push exercises. How do I work around it? I tried using machines using my palms, but it sucks. That sounds like it sucks, man, but uh, hey, you know what you can do? I don't know if this would work, but what about the suicide grip on your bench? Go on a power rack, set, set the safety pins. You can even put them really high if you're scared of it even touching your chest at all. Leave it like a little bit above your, your chest and do suicide grip, right? That might work. If not, weighted push-ups, good to go. Push-ups don't even like, you're fine, it's on your palms. So try that out, okay? And you could have someone put plates on your back. And if you wanna do it in a power rack, well, Take a wooden board, lay it across the pins, and now you can do flat hands. Isn't that genius? So that's what I recommend. Hey Alex, does mixed grip and conventional deadlift actually causes muscular imbalances and traps? It definitely can. The mixed grip is known to cause imbalances for a lot of people. I know Alan Thrall had a really bad experience with this, and there's another YouTuber that comes to mind who uh, really had a bad experience. So uh, double overhand is pretty much the best way to do things, in my opinion, uh, using hook grip as well, but I would say like, why hook grip if you're not a competitive athlete? Like just use double overhand with straps. Solves all your problems, so, solves all the, the thumb pain. I mean, it's great for bodybuilding, no grip issues. That's what I would do personally. Double overhand with straps. If you want to hook, be my guest. But that's what I would do, okay? Mix is like, you can run that for a long period of time, but you might get an imbalance as possible. Now I have made videos explaining how to not get imbalances from mixed grip. You can check those out. But I think the best advice is to stick to double overhand with straps or hook grip. You pick. What is your favorite row that isn't straight weight? Definitely the band row while standing up. So I'm gonna go on a power rack, I'll take a band and I'll double it, and then I'll do rows. That feels so freaking good, like it's, it's no stress in the lower back. You get an amazing pump, it's great for rejuvenation, like you can't go wrong with that row. Then my second favorite would have to be the uh, cable row. The seated cable row, I've always loved that exercise. I've never been a fan of machines, but the seated cable row, it's like, wow great 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 lift so those are my two favorites okay hey i only have 21 inch legs but they look like freaking tree trunks on pictures could that be because i don't have enough mass on my upper body was it just some weird anthropometry thing i'm still a novice around six feet tall and 150 pounds i don't know what it could be it might also be that um you think you're big but you're not like i've seen some people say that oh look at these uh, fifa players look how jacked they are when most intermediate lifters are more jacked than that so it depends on your perception here. Uh, 21 inch legs is not really that big. And if you're six feet at 150 pounds, I can't envision that being that big. Unless you just have some weird anthropometry or like you're genetically blessed in some way that your legs look big. I don't know, I haven't seen any pictures, but it just seems unlikely to me that you'd be six feet at 150 pounds. Like that's very skinny, my man. And as a taller guy, like 21 inches is usually not gonna cut it. A shorter guy might get away with that might like maybe still like it's not it's not big bro so i don't know what the situation is in my opinion you should keep focusing on your legs taller guys usually have uh like they usually got to put in more work okay as opposed to a shorter guy who just fills in easier so do more work man okay can i build a big neck without the high volume stuff for example just three sets of 10 three to four times a week high reps make me dizzy of course all while progressive overload taking place yeah of course why not if you're gonna be doing three by ten use a slower tempo control it squeeze the neck and progressively overload. You'll be okay. The only problem you might experience is the weight lifted. You'll reach a point where you'll be hitting 90 pounds and it's like, it won't feel that heavy. So what are you gonna do then? High reps is really the best way going forward. But besides that, enjoy the gains. It's gonna work just fine. How do you measure the neck? Where do you measure the neck? 
if I tilt my head back, my neck comes in around 17.5 inches, but just upright flexed, it's more like 16 and a half. Well, you want to measure it right above your Adam's apple, so right here. You, I know you can't really see mine because the beard, I'm sorry, but right above the Adam's apple, just tilt it up a little bit. You don't have to be all the way back here. Just move it up, go all around, simple stuff, okay? I get dizzy during neck training. Any quick fixes? Well, the quickest fix is what the other guy wrote. Um, you do three sets of 8 to 12 reps using a slower tempo, uh, squeezing the muscles, all that. That'll usually correct it. Another thing is to do like your neck curls off the floor. Okay, this way you're not getting full range of motion and when you do that, it gives you an opportunity to rest in a sense. So I would just slow down the tempo, don't keep the reps as high. And if you're having problems with neck curl, do it on the floor. It should be good like that. I train my neck before every workout, five days a week. I do one set until failure for any of the four sides. Yeah, will my neck get bigger? Keep it natural, keep it real. Yeah, bro, of course. You train your neck five days a week using one set to failure, all the angles, that's perfect. Think about what you're doing at the end of the week. That is essentially five sets per area till failure, every side, five times a week. It gave five times a week muscle protein synthesis. Of course you're gonna get a bigger neck. Like this is great for combat athletes in particular. Because I've always said you should be training it five times a week if you do compete in some type of sport like that. So you'll have that specific carryover, you'll have the muscle building benefits, you'll have the frequency, everything is gonna be fine. Like this is a great way to train your neck. So enjoy the gains, my friend. And send me some before and after pictures, all right? I quite often read that resistance bands aren't that good for growth as the eccentric part gets easier on the way down. Your opinion on this? Well, that's called uh, overspeed eccentrics. Essentially, the band is like pulling you down really hard. But I wouldn't say that makes it easier. If anything, that makes it harder. If you resist the band, then it makes it harder. Now, if you go with the flow of the band, like your free falling speed, then it, it'll definitely be easier. But if you resist it, if you do double bands, it, it gets difficult on the way down because it's really, really pulling. So if you're using a slower tempo, it's actually very challenging. It's only when you're doing like speed work and stuff like that, or you're doing very fast repetitions where it's definitely easier because of the overspeed eccentrics. But if you resist it, like bro, it's hard stuff. Really, really hard stuff and you'll get mad sore. Do you think 900 pound deadlift is achievable naturally? I do think it's achievable naturally. And there are some people who have already pulled that naturally. Now obviously this will depend on the style. High handle trap bar deadlift, it's, it's been done time and time again. Uh, sumo deadlift, probably doable. Behind the back deadlift, probably doable. So it depends on how you're doing it. But do I think a 900 pound conventional deadlift is possible naturally? Yeah, yeah I do. I think you have to be a genetic freak to pull that off. Really long arms, you just build like a tank. But I'm sure there are some freaks that could pull it off. Will it be you and me? Very likely no. Like it's just, I don't see myself ever pulling that. It's good not to set limitations, but we also gotta be realistic. So I think most people, like easily 99.9% .9 of the population will not hit that. But I really do believe that there are some freaks, like there are people in this world who will have the leverages to pull that off, okay? But they're gonna be so rare that like, does it really matter what they could do? That said, I would say that 700 is far more realistic. And even 800, I think that's more common. But 900, natural, is like you have to be free to pull that off. Just my opinion. Do you find dead bench has a high carryover to the bench? And is it safe? I might put the bar angled on the power rack and create a symmetry. Yeah. I've had that problem with a symmetry, dude. Sometimes when you're doing the dead bench, it's like, yeah, it could be a little bit angled. So what I'll usually do is I will actually rack pull above the knee to weight. And I'll shift it so that it's even on both sides. Like it's not too much on the edge on one side of the pins. You know what I'm saying? And that gets rid of the uh, symmetry issue. And I also make sure that my bench is like really even with the center knurling of the bar, all right? Now, regards to carryover, yeah, the dead bench is a beautiful lift, man. I've been using it primarily, and my raw bench is increasing like crazy. You have no idea. I've been building my strength using the dead bench, doing a close grip, wide grip. Like, it's really, really, really effective. And you're gonna see where my bench numbers are at soon, okay? You'll, you'll see. This is what dead benching, along with other exercise, and just concurrent periodization in general, is capable of producing, okay? So stay tuned for that, and that's all I really have for today's Q&A video. I hope you enjoyed it. I liked it. I thought the questions were great. The only thing was, like, there's a lot of noise here. I don't know if you can pick it up, all right, but it's really, really, really loud. And I hear the airplanes. I hear all these, these bugs and stuff. Like, it's, do you hear this? Like, it's something else. So I don't know if I'll do this frequently, but it was nice. Hope you enjoyed it, man. Give me your feedback down below, and uh, I'm glad you guys are enjoying the Spotify playlist. I'm getting some really good feedback on it. So talk to you next week, all right?